All right, John chapter 19. Let's read verses 1 through 5. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the lesson tonight. Uh, then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Now, I, I probably should have made my notes on that tonight. I'll probably do that next Wednesday night if I can remember it. What was the scourging about? If you could, if I, in fact, if I could just, just ask you right now, just, if you could just think very quickly, something in the Bible related to why they scourged him, what would you think of? It's very simple. It's something you all know. It's a passage of scripture that when I say it, you're going to go, oh yeah, that's what it is. What is it? Huh? Nope. Huh? Which says, you're in the right neighborhood by, there you go, by his stripes, we are healed. Okay? They scourged him. Okay? We, we literally... With a whip, that some say it was a cat of nine tails, could have been, I don't know. But I mean, they bloodied his back. Okay? And um, there's actually fulfills a, a part of the law concerning certain sins, like the sin of adultery. Uh, you could be scourged for, uh, for different things like that, uh, and you're whipped 40 times. That's a lot. My mom whipped me a lot, but she never hit me 40 times in one, one deal. And I'm thankful for that. Anyway, and the soldiers platted. Now, I want you to pay attention to the word plat and what that means. In fact, I may go around and ask you what that means in a minute. They platted a crown of thorns, and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. Were they serious about that? No, they didn't believe that. They were making fun of him. They were mocking him. And yet there he was, king of the Jews. Hail, king of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Okay, they buffeted him. They, they, they punched him in the face. They slapped him with their hands. Uh, but they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and, and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Pilate wanted out of this so bad. He knew he was doing the wrong thing. But the pressure being put on him by the Jews, the pressure being put on him uh, just by the people, and the fact that this was going to fulfill God's plan of salvation, Pilate wasn't going to get out of it. So he brings it up again. I find no fault in him. What do you want me to do with him? Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, and you underline these three words in your Bible, behold the man. Because the, the teaching that I do um, in talking about the, um, you know, where dragons dwell, uh, today I recorded, it took almost all day long to get it out, to get one video out, uh, Southwest Radio wanted them, so I had to do them today, and, uh, but the, the recording I did today dealt with one of the speakers at MUFON, uh, that everybody calls the owl guy. And he, is, he wrote two books, he's done a, a ton of videos, he's done uh, lectures all over the country, uh, and everybody knows him as the, as, the, uh, as the owl guy. And he is one of these who favors um, these demonic, evil angel spirits that are posing as aliens from some planet that are going to come down and bring us into a new age of peace and enlightenment and, and so on and so on. And he believes that these owls, that her, he's, he shows that in uh, many, many cases of a UFO event, people will see these owls. And in some cases, they're about four feet tall. As far as I know, there's no such thing 
in taxonomy as a four foot owl. Okay. Um, so that's not normal, but people see things like that. And, uh, he teaches that those are good, positive signs. He sees them as messengers being sent to this earth, sort of like it's sort of like John the Baptist or sort of like Elijah, how Elijah is supposed to come before the day of the Lord and, and say, hey, he's coming, make you, you know, prepare the way. He sees the owls that way. And everybody now that sees these owls are, are this is a, a positive sign to them that these quote unquote aliens are here for our benefit. Okay, but they're not. What was I, where was I going with that? Cause that was, oh, so anyway, the owls and the dragons usually are mentioned together as being dwelling together in a place where there is no son of man. And, it, and one verse specifically says son of man, the son of man's gone. So when Pilate says, behold, the man, not just a man. The man. Um, he is introducing to the world and making it known. This is the man of all. This is the second Adam. The, the new Adam, as it were. Okay? And so that's why I think that's important. Uh, Paul then uses that uh, idea of the man when referring to Christ Jesus. There's, there's one mediator between God and men. The man. Christ Jesus. And so that's very, very important. And by the way, I do not foresee at any time ever where Christ will want us to refer to him in the opposite gender. Amen. All right. Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. Thank you, God, for this gathering. Lord, bless those who are here. Bless those who are attentive. I pray to your God, Lord, that your word would go forth. Lord, the devil just fights and he fights and he fights. And, and Lord, sometimes I'm up to it, sometimes I'm not. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just make him get out of the way and for us to learn something good from your word tonight. Just fill our hearts and our heads, and our minds with knowledge. And Lord, unite us together in love. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said amen and amen. Now, what is the significance now? Uh, what does it mean, by the way, did somebody look up the word plat? They platted a crown of thorns. What does that mean? Okay. Is that what you? Yeah. It's woven. It's, they, they took it and interlaced it. Okay. So basically you have something that looks like DNA. Woven together. I want you to notice that it's a crown. They could have put it. You know, they could have wrapped it around, I guess, his, his midriff. They could, have, they could have wrapped it around his arms. Uh, they could have put it around his legs, his knees, whatever. But they didn't. They made a crown out of it, and they took a reed. One, one gospel says they took a rod and tapped it down into it so that the thorn stuck down into the skin, causing then blood to run down his face. There's a ton of blood in your face. It's what gives us our color and so on. And all of that blood running down Jesus' face when they tap that down in there. And the whole idea was the symbolism, number one, of thorns and the symbolism of the fact that it's a crown. The crown always denotes a king. Always. Anytime you see something with a crown, there's a king involved. Even in the even in a, a cult. Uh, symbolism like in Freemasonry where you have the double-headed eagle and there's a crown on top of it that that is telling you that this represents a king of some sort this is a this this thing is going to reign over people it is going to rule over them and so let's go back through the scriptures and let's look at the meaning of these thorns turn to Genesis 3 that is the first uh, occurrence of thorns in the Bible and we understand if you've read Genesis 3, you know what it is and you know what it's about. And you know uh, what the thorns then symbolize here in this spot. 
In Genesis 3, the serpent beguiled Eve, and she ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She gave to her husband. Her husband did eat as well. Um, I, I just made three videos. Boom, boom, boom. I, boy, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time putting the notes together and getting them recorded. Uh, concerning the things that I found and, and uh, discovered and heard and knew from the MUFON conference. One of the things that I have not got to yet is the pastor's wife, uh, who basically, from this one dream experience that she had, uh, she, is, she has changed her, her whole family now against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, to, to me, I... And I wish God would have given me those words while I was standing there talking to her because I, would have, I sure would have said them. Uh, but he didn't, and so it must have had a reason for it. But when, when I see that this woman has this dream experience where she believes that she's dead and she goes to this place of darkness that she calls outer darkness. When I read that, John, I went, are you kidding me? Here's this woman, she's been in church, she knows what outer darkness is, but that's the place that she wrote, outer darkness. And she's in this place and, and can't see anything and, and, um, and the experience that she had and the, and the entity that was behind her, a masculine entity that was her guide and so on. And uh, I just see very plainly that God was testing this woman. Because here she is, supposed to be a Southern Baptist uh, you know, a uh, member of the Southern Baptist Church. Her husband's a preacher in the Southern Baptist denomination. They're both supposed to be Bible-believing Christians. And yet, they have this, she has this one test, this one experience. And because of that, it's altered her entire belief system. She no longer believes anything that she used to believe. She don't believe the Bible anymore. She don't believe... Uh, that Christ is the only way to salvation. I mean, she don't believe nothing. And, and the amazing thing is, she, she's like Eve, who eats the fruit, and all of a sudden, her eyes are open now. She's got a new understanding. She's fallen for this new religion. And when she tells her husband, she was expecting her husband, I guess, to slap her around, you know, and say, we don't believe that stuff. But that's not what he did. He fell right in, in line with her. In other words, she gave him the fruit and he ate too. And instantly, both of them now, and their kids, they've got kids, girls, daughters that they're raising. Now they're turned again, the whole family's turned against it. It's the sins of the father, amen, carried down into the third and fourth generation. And so anyway, I'm I just, just amazed at that and that story because it just, it rings true of Adam and Eve. It just, it matches perfectly that story. And I just, I haven't had time to get to that yet. But anyway, in Genesis chapter 3, we have, we have Eve eating of the fruit that she knows she's forbidden to eat, but she, she believes the lie that she's been told. She believes that she's going to have, that she's going to be as the gods, knowing good and evil, and she gives it to her husband, and he does eat as well. And so now things are different. And God is going to curse all three of them. God's going to curse the serpent, He's going to take his legs off, and now he's going to have to crawl on his belly. He's going to be on the ground always. He's going to be the lowest thing that there is. He's going to curse the woman, and then he's going to curse Adam. And here's what he said to Adam in verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Boy, I tell you what, I just... I pray for this couple. I do. My heart sometimes aches. For this man and woman that I, I wish I'd have met the husband, but maybe I'm glad I didn't. I don't know. Um, but he listened to his wife. He hearkened unto the voice of his wife. And hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life and and this is true it it just is for some reason i and i guess this is it the things that we want in our gardens whether they're flower gardens or vegetable gardens or we have a field of wheat or we have vines or whatever it is 
It just seems like the good things that we want out of that, out of that garden or out of that field, we labor and we work and we, I mean, we just toil and we sweat and everything else just trying to get that to grow so that it can bring forth fruit. And yet, how much work do we have to, to put into growing thorns and thistles? Ah, oh, it's the easiest thing in the world. In fact, I'm just, maybe I'll just change my whole mindset. I'm going to have the world's first thistle garden. Have everybody come from miles around to see it. World famous thistles and thorns. Feel them, touch them, okay? Because it'll be the easiest thing in the world to do. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living, and Adam, unto Adam also unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins, and clothe them. This is God clothing them. This is God uh, bringing righteousness to them and so on. But we go back to the curse of Adam. And the curse of Adam had to do with, he was the one that was going to be toiling and laboring in the field. And he was going to be working and the sweat was going to pour off his face. And every bite that he took was going to take his labor. It was going to take his work. And as much as he worked and as hard as he worked, he was never, and listen to this now, he was never, ever, ever going to get the thorns fully taken out of his field. I can tell you that that stupid flower bed in front of my house aggravates me so much, I, they just keep coming back. I keep pulling them out and they keep coming back. And as long as I live and as long as there's dirt there, there's always going to be those thorns growing out of that thing and they're always going to be there. That's part of the curse. So now watch this. Um, you know, I don't, I don't look at much on Facebook. And when I saw something the other day, it reminded me of why I don't look at much on Facebook. I don't know who it was. I don't know what she was getting at. But this lady made some kind of statement that um, marry the right kind of man so that your children do not receive generational curses. Now, ladies... What kind of man is that? Number one, he doesn't exist. Number two, marrying a good person does not remove generational curses. Except for one man, Jesus Christ. People need to understand, and, and listen, there's so much garbage out on the internet, and, you're, and if you're not careful, you're going to fall for it. Because I've had, I've had some of our people ask me about, do, am I under a generational curse? Are you saved? Yes. Then no. You're not. Because Christ removes all the curses at Calvary. All of them. And if you've been told now that you can be saved, born again, but Christ didn't die and remove some of the curses that you think have been handed down to you because your dad or your grandpa or whatever, you, you've just swallowed the wrong doctrine is what you've done. But the idea is, is that when Christ went, is that somebody? Yeah, check it out. When Christ took that, that crown of thorns on his head, when he, when he bore that crown, he was taking this curse away from us in his death. So that when he died, the curse of the thorns die with him. So, and, the, and Colossians tells us that, are we good? Nobody's car's on fire or nothing? All right, all right, that's fine. 
So anyway, when uh, the book of Colossians tells us that Christ made a show of his enemies openly on the cross so that when he died, all of the enemies that were against us died with him, including the last thing that to be destroyed, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when Christ died, he killed death on the cross for us. That's what those crown of thorns on his head represented was this curse right here being taken away from us so that when we die and we are now in the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth, I promise you there is not going to be any sticker bush anywhere. Roses, or you're going to be able to pick them and smell them and not go, ow! Amen! You'll be able to run through the woods without, oh man, we, we would play in the woods when I was a kid, we'd run through the woods and then you'd run into, well, I always call them sticker trees, sticker bushes. We'd run into them sticker bushes and you'd be going, ah! And very slowly have to get your way out of there and, oh man, that hurt. But Christ removes every one of those. Now, turn to Numbers 33. Numbers. Numbers chapter 33, verse 54. Um, God's telling them when they get into the promised land, they're, in verse 52, they're supposed to drive out all the inhabitants of the land, destroy all their pictures, their molten images, and pluck down their high places. You'll dispossess the inhabitants of the land in verse 53. And then in verse 54, here's what he says. And you shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. And to the more you shall give the more inheritance. And to the fewer you shall give the less inheritance. And what God's doing is God's being fair about it. So let's say that there was, um, there was uh, 200,000 of the tribe of Judah. Should they get less land than the 50,000 of the tribe of Benjamin? No, they should get more land. And God, so God divided it and told them to divide it exactly that way. When you look at uh, grace, the grace of God is always given out in exactly the amount that each one of us needs. To those who it seems like Every single day is a struggle. God gives a lot of grace to those people. Now, there's some people that it doesn't seem like that they just have a lot of problems. No one is problem free. No one is sin free. But there are some that... Well, let, think about what Jesus said to the woman that uh, washed his feet with her tears. Uh, she has, she loves me more because she has been forgiven of more. And I'm probably quoting that badly, but that's the idea and the gist of it. Was that this woman loved Jesus so much. Because he forgave her of more than what he's ever forgiven anybody else. So let's say that, let's say that you uh, get a notice in the mail. Some traffic light took your picture of you running a stop sign, and uh, you had to pay a seventy-five dollar fine. And you go down to the courthouse, and you don't, you don't. You, all of a sudden, you realize you left your checkbook at home, you left your cash at home, you don't have any money. And so somebody standing there says, you know what, today's your, today's your blessed day. God brought me here to be a blessing to somebody, and I'm going to pay your ticket for you. How much was it? $75. I'm going to pay your ticket for you, $75. And you just say, man, thank you. I just, I don't know what to do. Don't do anything. Just it's at, some, at some point, find somebody that needs it and, and pass it on, you know. Then somebody comes in while that guy's standing there. And their son has run up a bunch of traffic tickets. And they're there to just find out how much the tickets are. They know they can't pay them. 
They find out the son's racked up, you know, $3,000 worth of traffic tickets. The same guy that paid the $75 ticket, he pulls out his checkbook and he writes a check for $3,000 and he pays off this lady's son's traffic fines. So now he's free. Which one do you think is going to love that guy more? The one who was forgiven of more. And so all of us lived a life of sin. All of us have come short of the glory of God. There are some people that we have met and some people that uh, have come in, in our path of life that we have seen God literally just clean up multitudes of sin I think of my brother-in-law every time I know the things that he did I know things that he did when he was a teenager and if you knew what I knew about him you would be like are you kidding me no he was bad he was bad for a long time but God forgave him of every single one of them and I'm telling you, the last week of Steve Leonard's life was spent. He was in his Bible. He was witnessing to his son, his daughter. He was, he was getting ready to leave this world and go home. And that is exactly what he did at the end of that week. And he loved God a lot because God he knew God forgave him of a lot now let me get back to the lesson <laughs> uh, in verse um, 55 but if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you then they had an obligation to run everybody out if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes like thorns and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that, that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. Now, what does it mean to vex them? Lot was vexed from living in Sodom. Lot had to see what was going on in Sodom every single day. He watched it. It was done, I think, out in the streets. It was done all over town. He had to see this. He's trying to raise a family in this. He's trying to keep his daughter's uh, virgin in this in this mess he's trying to raise a family I mean he's just he is but it's vexing him it is troubling him and the Bible will teach us that things that vex us have a way of wearing us down too we can only put up with so much of other people's lives, other people's lifestyles, the way people live. I tell you what, I'm encouraged. Uh, there's a couple of uh, YouTube channels that, that feature this. I'm encouraged when I see even lost families, husbands and wives standing up at school board meetings, reading from the filthy book that the librarian was encouraging the children to read, children in third grade, children in fourth grade, who knew nothing about the way of life of an adult, and yet they're having it forced down their throat in the most evil, disgusting way. And these men stand up and start reading, and it's funny to watch the, the school board say, oh, Sir, you're, you're, you can't say that here. Really? Then how come my son can read it? People have had enough of it. People have had enough of it. I, that, that encourages me. I don't know if it's ever really going to change everything, but it encourages me to see even the lost crowd has had enough of it. Okay? 
It vexes you, and you finally have to say, I can't, I can't live with this anymore. I can't live with this anymore. We have, we have somebody that he's eventually going to, he, he's going to come and visit. I'm not going to tell you his name yet. He's been following our ministry for years. I've talked to him on the phone many times. Wonderful guy. I just love him to death. But he lived, guess where? Redding, California. And he said, Mike, the whole town's nuts. The whole town. He said, that's where that other Bethel church is. He said, the whole town's crazy like this. And he lived out there for years. Now he's moved to the Midwest. He lives in uh, Lake St. Louis. And he says, I can't believe. He's actually from another country. And he says, I can't believe how the people here are in the Midwest better than what you find on the West Coast or the East Coast. He said, I can't believe it. He said, people have, have, have helped us. People have, have uh, done things for us. And he said, they've been nice to us and everything like that. And he said, I never got that in California. I never got that in New York. And, he's, and I said, well, you're basically in part of what's known as the Bible Belt. Missouri, uh, Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, not Louisiana, but <laughs> Mississippi, you know. <laughs> Uh, it's a different belt in Louisiana, okay? <laughs> but anyway, he said, I just, I just can't believe it. It's different people. Anyway, back to this. He says here in verse 55, he said, you've got to run those people out because if you don't, they're going to be pricks in your eyes and they're going to be thorns in your sides and they're going to vex you. And you're going to have to put up with that. You're going to have to make a decision every day not to live the way they're living. And the truth of it is, the reason why people drop out of church, drop out of church attendance, is because the vexation became too much. And they just... Fell right into it. Those thorns that you see here are the people that live in that land and Christ died also to remove their power against you. That's what he died for. Joshua 23, same thing. Joshua 23 Let me see. Yeah, Joshua 23 and Judges um, basically are saying the same thing. Joshua 23, God says in verse 11, Take heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God, else if you do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant in these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them, and they unto you know for certain it that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of those nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you. Now, how many of you believe that the devil will set up false brethren and false friends to put you into a snare and a trap? Thank you. He'll do it. He'll get you linked in with somebody, somebody you might like. And all of a sudden, the things that they do, you start doing. When I was a kid, I, I tried to be a good church kid. But there was boys in, in our neighborhood that my mama told me several times, I don't like you hanging around them. I wish I'd listened to her, but I didn't. And those, those boys got me in snares and traps and scourges in my side and thorns in my eye. Notice that 
Count these things. How many is there? Four, snares, traps, scourges, and thorns. Talking about devils now. Until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Now, here's, here's what I can clearly see. God allowed me to get in with this crowd, this group. So that at some point in my life, I'm going to have to make a decision on what kind of life I really want to live. Do I want to live like these guys? Do I want to do what they're doing? Do I want to go where they go? Do I want to be like them? Or do I still want to serve God like God convinced me when I was 16 years old and I bowed right here and surrendered to the ministry? Do I, do I want to go in that direction? And I'm just, I'm telling you, everybody listening to my voice, at some point it's already happened to you and it will happen again. The wrong crowd will be a trap for you. And when you get caught up into them, you're going to, at some point, hopefully you realize this was a setup. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have gone this way. I, I shouldn't have made this decision. Hopefully, it won't be too late for you. Hopefully, God will say, come back home. I'm waiting for you. Come back home. I'll, I'll take the snares and the traps and the thorns. I died for those. I took away their power against you if you will come to me and live for me and live my way. I will remove that from you. But at some point you got to decide that's what you want to do. And uh, notice that the snares and the traps and the scourges and the thorns are there to, and they will stay there until you perish from off this good land. In other words... Everything you learned as a Christian growing up, everything you learned about the Bible, everything you heard the preacher say, God says, I'm going to take that away from you until you perish. Because you chose the friends that you made. You chose the crowd that you wanted to run with. You decided you wanted that more than you wanted church, more than you wanted Bible, more than you wanted prayer, more than you wanted preaching, more than you wanted a lifestyle of, to live. You decided you wanted the party and the scene and everything else. And it'll be a miracle from heaven if God saves you out of that. Young people, listen to every adult. And adults, be honest with these kids. Tell them. Tell them what you got into. Tell them the mistakes you made. And tell them it's not worth it. In fact, I mean, I, I like the fact we got a school here and, and we got some that go to Twin City. I can tell you that my first year at Twin City Christian Academy, I picked the worst boy in the whole seventh grade to be my buddy. His name was Jimmy Adams. And I probably got more paddlings over what I did with him than what I had just done by myself. And I had, I had teachers coming to me. Mike, let me talk to you for a minute. Mike, boy, I, I, I think you're a good kid, but we know Jimmy. He's troubled, man. He's, got, he's going in the wrong path. And... And, you know, we just want to encourage you, man, just get away from him and stay away from him. I didn't listen to him. Big mistakes, big mistakes. So that in Judges, that's what he says. 
Uh, look at verse 3. I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. They knew they had made a mistake, and God was not going to change it for them. So they knew that their entire life, they were going to have to deal with these thorns. And they were going to have to work to keep these thorns from where we're eventually going with this is the Gospels. They're going to have to keep these thorns from choking out the Word of God. And we'll probably talk about some serious stuff that night. 